finding the place. Um, but we'll just begin. Does this sound seem good to everyone? So I'm very happy and delighted and honored to introduce Gary Kinsman. Um, Gary is the leading scholar. <laughs> he doesn't like being introduced, but it's <laughs> good. Are you worried? Uh, of state regulation of sexuality, definitely in Canada, um, and with really wonderful resources, I think, for people who are doing work everywhere. Um, he's the author of The Regulation of Desire, co-author of the Canadian War on Queers, as well as innumerable, well, they're innumerable, but I don't, I'm not going to list them all, uh, articles and book chapters. Um, and he's been also a foundational member of a lot of queer movements in this context, so it's an early involvement in the Toronto Pride world. He did, started Pride Newfoundland and then Pride Sudbury. And you couldn't remember if you were, if you started Pride Parades in Nova Scotia? No, <laughs> didn't. Um, but one of the reasons that I'm really uh, always so happy to introduce Gary and his talking is that in my experience and in talking to other people, Gary has consistently throughout his life always been someone who nurtures and nourishes other people in their work. So in their political work, in their intellectual work, um, he's a mentor and a generous person who I think is incredibly gifted and skilled at uh, bringing out the wisdom that people have in them. Um, and so he's uh, one of these rare people who's a movement intellectual who's also managed to live and survive in academia and to do it with generosity and grace. Um, he just retired, so now he gets to be um, less careful in everything. So I, I actually don't think that you've ever been very careful. Um, ever. So that's also something that's really kind of amazing. Uh, and tonight we're going to be um, able to hear him talk about direct action. So please join me in welcoming Gary Kinsman. Okay, so I can't see any of you, so if you really do want to stop me, you have to throw something at me. Okay. Um, so, a couple of things before we get going. Um, I wanted to dedicate the talk tonight um, to all of those who've died of AIDS-related disorders um, in the northern part of Turtle Island. And I wanted to mention some names in particular um, of people who are really quite centrally involved in AIDS activism who have died. So in terms of people who are involved in AIDS action now, and this is a highly selective list, um, I want to dedicate this talk to George Smith, Michael Smith, David Marriage, James Thatcher, who is right there um, in that picture, Chuck Groschmal, who is right there in this picture, um, to Michael Lynch, uh, Doug Wilson, and there are many, many other people from AIDS Action now. In relationship to the Nova Scotia PWA Coalition, I want to dedicate this talk to Peter Wood and Dale Oxford. Uh, and again, there's many other names that could be mentioned. And in terms of the Vancouver PWA Coalition, I want to dedicate this talk to Kevin Brown and Warren Jensen. These are all major AIDS activists um, who died um, in the late 80s or early 1990s. Now the title for the talk, Direct Action Equals Life, is actually a transformation of a slogan that came from the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power um, in New York City um, that we also adopted in AIDS Action Now um, in uh, in Toronto. So, silence equals death, which I'm sure everyone is probably familiar with, although I should point out that when I first saw this on someone's t-shirt, it was in a photograph, and the t-shirt was sort of folded over, so it actually read to me as science equals death, and I sort of thought, that sounds a little bit maybe extreme, but okay. okay. Um, and the second part was always action equals life. So what I'm going to try and do is to focus on direct action equals life in terms of this talk. I also have to say, to preface some of this stuff, that what I've learned at this conference, both last night and today, would actually lead me to want to recast a lot of what I'm saying. I'm going to try to do that a little bit in terms of rejigging, um, but I also think that's a sign of a really successful conference, that it actually has brought out so many new perspectives that actually ask us uh, to try to rethink um, things in new ways. 
The final thing I want to talk about is why this is in Scare Quotes Canada, because um, I think it's really important uh, for me, especially because I'm often identified by other people as being a historian of sexual regulation in Canada or of AIDS activism in Canada, is that I think it's actually really crucial that we always put Canada in question. We always trouble Canada. Um, and if we don't do that in our work, we're actually papering over or making invisible uh, the colonization of Indigenous people. And I think it's absolutely central that we not do that in our work. Uh, so that's why I think it's consistently necessary to constantly trouble and question Canada. And to also recognize um, there was some discussion at the conference previously on a number of occasions about homo-nationalism. And I think people often think about homo-nationalism um, in, in, in a sort of context of orientalist homo-nationalism, the ways in which uh, places like Canada get constructed as being supposedly advanced and civilized, well, people in the Middle East and especially Arab and Muslim identified people get constructed as being barbaric. It's really important that we challenge that Orientalist form of homo-nationalism, but it's absolutely central that we also challenge what Scott Morganson has referred to as settler homo-nationalism. And I don't think we do that enough in our work, and I think that's actually crucial also to do in relationship uh, to the historical work we do in relationship to AIDS activism. So I actually, this presentation in terms of PowerPoint, which I still remain ambivalent about whether PowerPoint has any pedagogical utility at all, except for images, um, I have to point out to you that unfortunately, it's actually rather sparse in terms of images. Um, but we're, we'll correct that, both AIDS Action Now is correcting that, and hopefully the AIDS Activist History Project We'll, we'll correct that as well. So part of the, the theme for me that emerges for my work, and it in major ways comes out of the work that I did with Patricia Gentile on the Canadian War on Queers, is this notion of the social organization of forgetting. And the necessary antidote to that being the resistance of remembering. So I just wanted to unpack that a little bit, first in general, and then specifically in relationship uh, to histories of AIDS activism. So one of the things that I think is really important for us all to recognize is that one of the ways that ruling takes place in our society, in a, in a capitalist, patriarchal, racist society, is through the systematic social organization of forgetting. And by that I don't mean, you know, our memories are bad or failing. Right? And oftentimes you do an interview with someone about the historical past, they will tell you, I don't remember anything. And then when you get them talking, they remember an awful lot. I'm not talking about the failure of our individual memories. I'm talking about how a systematic part of how ruling takes place in our society is the denial of forms of activism and resistance that have taken place in the past, um, the denial to us of the vocabularies um, and social literacies to actually be able to understand the struggles of people in the past in an embodied way, um, and that this is actually quite significant. I'll talk about this more generally and then move into talking about it in relationship to AIDS and HIV-related activism. One of the things that actually allows neoliberalism, for instance, to get away with hacking apart and destroying um, social programs that people fought for in the past, uh, what some people might refer to as the social wage, is that we cannot in any embodied way remember um, the struggles of people in the past that actually won such things as social assistance, or more access to education, or um, certain aspects of socialized healthcare. We, we, we don't have the capacities because we've been denied this. Um, an active memory of those people's struggles, because if we did have that as an embodied knowledge that we have, we would not stand for the types of cutbacks and slashing of social programs that is going on around us in the new climate of not only neoliberalism, but austerity. But we don't remember those things, or many of us don't remember those things. And there's specific reasons why people who have lots of, of power in our society don't want us to remember those practices of, of, of activism and resistance. That we actually won these things, even if they were given back to us in ways that we didn't really intend. Just to give you one example, when people 
early on in the 20th century and what's now called Canada were fighting for unemployment insurance, they never in their wildest imagination thought they would have to pay into it. It was something that the capitalists or the bosses would actually have to pay for. Oftentimes things have been given back to us when we've won victories in ways that are not what we really wanted. But nonetheless, they are real victories. They made real differences in people's lives. We don't remember those struggles that sometimes people actually died in if we're talking about the right to form unions. We don't remember those in an active, embodied way. So that's a general point about the social organization of forgetting and why recovering activist histories um, and developing the resistance of remembering is actually, I would say, quite crucial to transformative um, anti-capitalist, anti-oppressive uh, politics and movement building right now. Now what does this mean more specifically in relationship to AIDS activism? There's a number of things that we've systematically socially forgotten. Um, partly because the histories of AIDS activism um, have not been adequately recorded and not been adequately able to be communicated uh, to new layers of younger people who have got involved in AIDS organizing. But I just want to mention three examples that I hope will help to make this very clear to you. And there's many other examples that could be used. And some of us have some vague memories of this, but we don't sort of live it in an embodied fashion in terms of the, the resistance of remembering. So one of the things that's really important to point out is that I think there's a dominant mainstream history that's been produced now around AIDS that safe sex, or safer sex, as it's most often referred to, was somehow invented by public health uh, officials. And then was delivered to people as this is how you're actually going to be able to prevent uh, the transmission of HIV. That's not at all the case. But it's the mythology that's actually been put in place, um, facilitated by the social organization of forgetting. The practice of safe sex, and it was called safe sex at the initial point, um, was actually developed and, and facilitated by grassroots people coming out of community-based AIDS groups, uh, both gay men, lesbians, people informed by the feminist health movement, who actually figured out fairly early on the types of practices people needed to engage in to avoid the transmission of HIV. Right? Even before HIV was fully even understood as, as being um, the, the virus that um, would, would would be part of the process that would lead to the development of AIDS. People had figured out that it had something to do with um, the transmission of bodily fluids, blood-to-blood uh, -blood contact. People had begun to figure that out and had begun to, to articulate um, safer sets of practices for people. It's also important to point out that at that point in time, this wasn't suggested to people as an individual thing. That you know you should look at what the public health person tells you, and you should go through sort of like a rational process of calculation about what was risky and what wasn't, and what you were prepared to deal with. This was actually something that was put forward as a community responsibility, um, and it was also something that was eroticized. I mean, early on, um, coming out of community-based AIDS organizing, safe sex was hot. It was erotic. Um, it was something we all should be doing. It was not just the responsibility of individuals who were HIV positive. It was what everyone should be doing. And for a, a period of time, um, gay men in particular in relationship to safe sex did actually show that sexuality was socially made, socially constructed. Cindy Patton and other people have pointed this out because we were able to actually show that we could, in a community context with lots of support, alter the practices that people were engaging in. It was nothing sort of essential or biological that was necessitating we had to engage in these particular erotic practices. If they were eroticized in a community social context, this is something that everyone could engage in. So one of the things that I think is sort of under, under looked at is actually this history of early safe sex organizing um, and how it was about trying to build new forms of community um, based eroticism. Um, so it's really important to point out that safe sex didn't come from public health officials. Um, and what they actually did with this was they sanitized it, um, they, they in some ways um, distorted it, so they actually would now talk about, you know, um, you know, demonologists, right? Was, was, this one, was one of the things that public health departments would talk about. And of course, most people understand that as being serial monogamy, which is in many ways a recipe for the transmission 
of, of HIV infection. Um, and you know, maybe the use of condoms um, or abstinence. These were the types of things that they fed back to us, but this was not the basis uh, for the early uh, safe sex organizing campaign. So this is something that we've actually, in some major ways, forgotten about. But what this meant was the responsibility for engaging in safe practices was not simply the responsibility of an HIV-positive person. The decomposition and destruction of these community-based safe sex campaigns, I believe, actually opened up the door to the current criminalization of HIV people um, and the focus on only the HIV-positive person as being have, having any level of responsibility around questions of HIV transmission. Early on, it was everyone's responsibility to engage in safe practices. Everyone was assumed to possibly have HIV infection. This led to a very, very different approach than what's occurring right now. One of the things that is really important, if we can recover that history, it actually allows us, in a much stronger way, to be able to challenge the criminalization of people living with HIV right now. Now, another aspect of, of AIDS activism that has not been focused on very much is that you know, fairly early on from the beginning, people understood this was a global health crisis. And that how it was affecting people in the global south had an awful lot to do with the relationships of overdevelopment here and underdevelopment there. Um, and that this would actually need the transfer of resources from the north and the west to the global south if we were actually going to address um, this, the massiveness of the, of the AIDS crisis. This was developed in some ways um, in what I think is a really important document that's hardly ever been looked at in terms of the history of AIDS activism, which is the Montreal Manifesto that I will come back to later on. But it also meant that AIDS activists began to realize that AIDS and dealing with AIDS as a, as a social crisis, as a health crisis, was a condensation of all of the social relations that existed in our society. That you couldn't actually adequately address AIDS without dealing with class, without dealing with sexuality, without dealing with race and racialization, without dealing with, with gender, without dealing with questions of ability. Um, that was an understanding that was sort of there early on um, in the development of AIDS activism, and that's also something that's been lost. I mean, one of the, the really unfortunate things about the development of the AIDS crisis and the mainstream forms of AIDS organizing is that sort of global internationalist perspective that was there has been lost. So basically in some ways, it's not only the Western pharmaceutical corporations that have sentenced people in Africa to die of HIV infection when they have absolutely no access to the drugs and treatments that people here do, but unfortunately, um, the Western and Northern AIDS movements, by not continuing this struggle, have actually helped to facilitate that situation. And the final thing I want to talk about, which is the, the major thing I want to focus on here um, in this talk, is that treatments didn't come down from the medical profession and the pharmaceutical corporations saying, here we've got this wonderful new drug, it will save you. Right? It came from incredible forms of grassroots activism and resistance. Um, opening up the possibilities for people to have more access to treatments. It came from direct action politics, which I'll talk a little bit about later on. And that's why I'm talking about direct action uh, equals life in this talk. Um, so I don't quite know why this slide keeps sliding, because um, when it's actually on my computer, you can actually see it quite clearly. Um, but what I wanted to talk about in terms of the AIDS Activist History Project is that what we're interested in doing is collecting um, interviews, uh, talking to people, collecting documents and texts, um, so that people will actually have a record, an accessible record, of what AIDS activism was like in the so-called Canadian context. What I'm talking about here is perhaps somewhat different from some of that, in the sense that I'm trying to start with memory work, which is what I'm also using um, as a particular way of getting into the exploration of the emergence of the neoliberal queer in the so-called Canadian context as well. So I'm just going to talk for a second about what memory work is and why I think it's useful uh, for us. So in different ways, I'm drawing on the work of Ruth Frankenberg, who um, developed some very interesting perspectives on how women who have been racialized as white um, or have been constructed as being white, living within the social uh, construction of whiteness, um, can actually do memory work, critical memory work, to discover how it was they came to be white and to challenge that. 
and also I'm drawing on Frigga Hogg's work um, about female sexualization, um, which more systematically talked about the need for groups of women to actually engage in memory work, to discover and rediscover how it was they were actually made as made into and helped to make themselves into particular sort of uh, feminine um, individuals in the context of the types of patriarchal societies that we live in. Um, Figure Hogg developed a really interesting sort of Marxist feminist approach to these questions. So one of these things that's really important to talk about is memory always has a social character. We might think about memory as simply being individual. But even my own idiosyncratic experiences of, of remembering AIDS activism um, has a social and historical character to it. So as, a, as an important starting point for looking at um, the history of AIDS activism, it allows us to get into it and to begin to see the connections between what might be described as individual idiosyncratic experiences that do have a social character and the broader social and historical relations uh, that those experiences are part of. So in terms of just thinking about my memories, and I'm thinking here of the 80s, the very early 1990s for the purposes of this talk, um, there's a lot of emotions that come up when I actually think about what the AIDS crisis meant to me. Um, so there's profound experiences of pain, um, experiences of mourning. Um, I probably lost somewhere between 40 and 45 really close friends during the high point of the AIDS epidemic in Toronto. Um, experiences of anguish, um, but also incredible experiences of anger and rage that were collectivized when I was involved in groups like AIDS Action Now. There was a way in which we could actually take the sort of emotional responses of anger and rage um, and use them in particular ways to, to radicalize, politicize, and mobilize people. Now, Deborah Gould, in this book, Moving Politics, um, has talked a fair bit about the emotional dimensions of AIDS um, activism and ACT UP groups in the United States in particular. I think one of the things she points out is how this mobilization around anger and rage was able to actually produce lasting forms of activism, but also eventually would have limitations when certain types of political questions and differences would get raised. Now, I just threw this picture in from 1977. You can't see it that well here. Um, that's me frolicking in a park in Saskatoon in 1977, in the wonderful days before the AIDS crisis. Um, and many people refuse to believe that that's actually a picture of me, but I do remember this shirt. Uh, this top, so I think it's actually a picture of me. Um, and actually, I'm quite sure of that. So I wanted to take you back to some of my memories um, of the first response to AIDS in the so-called Canadian context. Um, one of my first recollections, I mean, obviously I was aware of this because I was reading the gay media as a gay activist um, in uh, Toronto um, in the early 1980s, but one of the first headlines I remember was from the Toronto Star, Gay Plague Arrives in Canada, right? Um, and this was an article that was produced around some of the first um, official cases of AIDS in the Canadian context. Now, this early development, and Sarah talked about this uh, yesterday night, the official de designation was gay-related immune deficiency, was the proper medical term at this point in time for what was going on. It was an incredible homosexualization of AIDS, um, which organized major forms of stigmatization and discrimination against queer people in a situation where we were already facing major forms of discrimination and stigmatization. I remember during this period of time that my mother would call me every single day with what she just read in the newspaper about AIDS and would ask me incessant questions about my health, right? Which really bugged me. I mean, I appreciated the concern, but you could actually see how her reading the mainstream media coverage was actually organizing this type of relationship to me at that point in time. Now, for, through the early 1980s, basically state forms of organization uh, professional forms of organization did nothing around AIDS and HIV. I mean, the Laboratory Centers for Disease Control in Ottawa counted the number of official cases and the number of official uh, number of people who died. One of my 
past when I was one of the first employees of the AIDS Committee of Toronto that was really depressing every week was I got to call the board twice centers for disease control to see what the official count was um, at that particular point in time. But basically, governments were not doing anything, basically being informed by the notion that AIDS was only affecting expendable populations to, to, to uh, use Ronald Reagan's expression uh, for this. Now, in response to this inaction, community organizations were formed. And this came out of gay activists, um, it came out of uh, some lesbians and other feminists who had been involved in feminist health activism, and we produced community-based AIDS groups, like the AIDS Committee of Toronto. Um, I, as I said already, I was one of the first employees of the AIDS Committee of Toronto. Um, I don't know if any of you can remember, but if any of you were in Toronto um, in the 1980s, but the first office of the AIDS Committee of Toronto um, was at the corner of Church and Wellesley, or near there, I was right above a Kentucky Fried Chicken outlet. So we had to live, uh, the three employees, our work life was lived in this office that just reeked of Kentucky Fried Chicken all the time. And then we would have these board of directors meetings for the AIDS Committee of Toronto, where all of the, the medical professionals that were on the board, and there were other people as well, would come in with their little boxes of Kentucky Fried Chicken, and they would just devour it during the, uh, the, the board meetings. Um, and our, one of our ways of surviving this as the three, the three workers in the office was to say we were secretly conducting a study on whether the consumption of Kentucky Fried Chicken actually would lead to the development of AIDS. Um, that was one of the things we actually had to do. So that was like some of the humor that was generated around the office at that point in time. But there were really important things that happened in the AIDS Committee of Toronto. But I want to highlight both the important things we did, but also how even from almost the beginning of the AIDS Committee of Toronto, there were significant problems that were being produced that would later on become real obstacles for the next wave of AIDS activism that would come a little bit later on in the 1980s. We did do some of the first safe sex education in Toronto. Um, we started off with ridiculous proposals. I reported on one of them last night, which was people credibly proposed that our major advice to gay men should be not to have sex with anyone from New York City or San Francisco. But there were far more interesting proposals that were also made uh, based on the type of work that Michael Callan um, and, and Greg Berkowitz were uh, developing in New York City at that time, which basically produced some of the major guidelines for what safe sex was all about. And again, it was safe sex was hot, it was exciting, it was about eroticism and keeping eroticism alive in the context of the AIDS crisis. We also did very significant types of support work uh, for people living with AIDS and HIV. But I also wanted to just report on one of my memories of having gone to one of the support group meetings, not an actual meeting where people were supporting people with um, AIDS or HIV infection, but a meeting of those people who were involved in doing support work in the AIDS Committee of Toronto. So I remember very clearly that people went around the room and identified who they were. Almost everyone, I mean there were two people who were staff members of the AIDS Committee of Toronto, almost everyone in that, the circle when we went around it had some sort of medical or professional relationship uh, to AIDS. They were somehow connected with the medical profession. And then there were three gay waiters who were in the circle when we went around, who were just interested in supporting uh, people living with AIDS at that point in time. What was really interesting was they never came back. Right? So there was a way in which even very early on you can see how there were certain practices of professionalization, class, and exclusion that were going on uh, in the social organization of the AIDS uh, Committee of Toronto. Um, one of the areas I was assigned to do work in uh, was to try to develop liaison with the Haitian community. Uh, which was mostly in Montreal at that point in time, but there was about um, four or five hundred Haitians living in Toronto. Um, at that point in time, along with gay men, um, Haitians were identified as being a risk group uh, for uh, the development of AIDS. Um, I remember when I was doing work at the AIDS Committee of Toronto, I would get phone call after phone call from people saying, I have a Haitian housekeeper, should I fire her? Right? So I mean, I had to deal with questions like that. So we tried to develop a liaison uh, with the Haitian community, and we developed a liaison with the Haitian community that was formed uh, to protest the Red Cross, saying that Haitians couldn't give blood um, at that point in time. So I did an awful lot of work, and 
the, the, the main Haitian person I was working with was really hesitant to be associated with, with white people and with gay men, right? But eventually I convinced him to come to a board meeting of the AIDS Committee of Toronto. What happened was really a nightmare because I was trying to develop alliances, coalition building between different communities, and what ended up happening was the Haitian representative who didn't, you know, who was not highly trained in medical professional lingo, um, got attacked by a number of the medical professional people on the board of the AIDS Committee of Toronto. Um, and it took a lot, an awful lot of work after that to actually get these people from the Haitian group to actually have anything to do with the AIDS Committee of Toronto. So this was in some ways informed by, you know, you're stupid, you're ignorant, you really don't know what the medical discourse around this is about, but it was also clearly informed by racism um, towards um, this Haitian man who was present um, at the AIDS Committee of Toronto. So I'm trying here to give you some indications of some of the problems that were there almost from the beginning in terms of the development of this community-based AIDS organization that would later on come to be called an AIDS service organization. So there's a process of transformation that takes place very quickly within um, the community-based AIDS groups. And initially, the funding is simply make work project funding. I mean, I was hired for six months uh, to work with ACT, and it was basically a make work project, right? There was still some funding available for these types of projects at that point in time. Um, but later on, health-related funding would actually be made available uh, to community-based AIDS groups, and this would be part of their transform transformation. So what was the health-related funding based on? You had to have boards of directors, you had to have an executive director, you had to have paid staff, your paid staff should have some professional qualifications for this, um, and there were major forms of regulation that came down on the community-based groups, uh, both around funding, um, and certain types of restrictions on their activity. I just want to talk about one person's work who I think is very insightful in this process, not that she did work specifically on the topic of AIDS or HIV, but Roxana Ng, who died uh, last year, um, did amazing work on the transformation of community-based groups through forms of state regulation and funding regulation from being groups that were intended in, in the particular situation she was describing to being groups that would actually assist immigrant women in getting different types of higher paid jobs into getting state funding and regulations so that all that these groups were actually doing was slotting immigrant women into low paid wage jobs. Right? I think we actually need to learn a fair bit from this type of work about what took place um, in relationship uh, to that transformation from community-based organizations um, into aid service organizations. Now, I just want to give you one example one instance that I remember from my work at the AIDS Committee of Toronto. Um, the staff was tasked with trying to figure out, because we wanted to have a charitable arm to raise money, what type of incorporation should we, we should get engaged in. So we went off and met with a lawyer, came back and proposed that there should be two levels of incorporation. There should be a foundation, there was a charitable arm, and the AIDS Committee of Toronto should actually be incorporated in a very different way, so it actually could be involved much more directly in advocacy and activist work. In its infinite wisdom, the board decided against our proposal and decided for one level of incorporation. So everything was to be related to the charitable tax debts. Um, we were told at that time this would have no impact on advocacy work or activism or politics um, in the AIDS community of Toronto. But within a year, members of the board, the more moderate, more conservative members of the board, knew exactly what to mobilize.